My name is Stephen Walensky, and I was fortunate enough to meet Ms. Sargadada Maharaj in about 1979. I went and spent as much time as I could from about 1979 until he died. But the program that you're about to see shows, shows footage of Maharaj and is an attempt to give a complete and concise format to look at what exactly he said, what exactly it means. <laughs> The Sargadana Maharaj was the only guru, the only teacher, the only person I ever worked with who spoke in sutras. And when he spoke to you, if you were fortunate, what he said went into you and caught it almost like a virus. And once that virus took hold of you, and once that virus took part of you, then what you found was you could not get it out of your psyche until until it was understood, if you will, until you experientially got it. The problem was that by getting it, everything that stood, every concept, every idea, every belief, every structure, every psycho-emotional archetype that you've had that stood in the way between you and getting it had to be discarded, dismantled, taken apart. And so we get really to the themes that he spoke in. And Maharaj has spoken sutras and there were several themes. The first theme that you see got all the material is Advaita Vedanta. I would call it the first theme because it's the, it's the most prevalent in the book, not necessarily the most instructive, but it was the biggest context. If you understand Advaita Vedanta, what it actually is, and you understand the context of what Nisargadatta was trying to give you. Vaita can be translated as one substance, not two. Everything is one substance, not two substances. Now, throughout the world of yoga, obviously, there are, there are statements, for example, in the Yoga Vashishta, which is one of the most famous books in India. Uh, the most famous statement out of there is, everything is consciousness, nothing exists outside of consciousness. If you went into tantric yoga, they refer to everything as undifferentiated consciousness or consciousness. So everything is consciousness, nothing is outside of consciousness. In Buddhism, they would say everything is form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Form is condensed emptiness, emptiness is thinned out form. But there's only one substance, not two. And that is the basic theme, Advaita hyphen Vedanta. Vedanta t technically means the end of the Vedas. Vedanta can be subsumed, subsumed under one word in Sanskrit, neti neti. Neti neti can be translated as not this, not that. Which means there's one substance, not two, and anything that comes up for you, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm high, I'm low, I'm right, I'm wrong, I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm, whatever that is, is discarded as not this, not this. And that is the overall context of what Nisargadatta Maharaj was always teaching. The second theme I would call Gyan. Maharaj is always talking about, talking about Gyan, being a Gyani, about Gyana. Gyan Yoga can be translated as the path of knowledge. But actually, it's the path of unlearning. The best way I could, I could describe this would be 
if you ever saw the Star Wars trilogy, in the second uh, part of the Star Wars uh, trilogy, you have the teacher, Yoda, and he's instructing the student, which is Luke Skywalker. And he says, Luke, you must unlearn that which you have learned. So, first context, first theme, Advaita Vedanta, one substance, not two. Everything is consciousness. Nothing is just outside of consciousness. Not this, not that. Anything that's there is not this, not that. The theme, Jnana Yoga. You must unlearn. The path of unlearning everything that you've been told about yourself is not, is to be discarded. What's pivotal about understanding that is that means everything. Because Maharaj would say things like, what you know about yourself came from outside of you. Therefore, discard it. Anything that you think you are, you're not. So obviously everything is always not this, not this. The next theme would be the I am. Throughout all of his work, it was always hold on to the I am, let go of everything else. Stay in the I am, be in the I am. And he always had this thing about the nonverbal I am and the verbal I am. The strongest question, the most frequent question that was asked of me for two decades was, what is the I am? So what I'd like to do is, rather than me talk about the I am and talk about the I am again, have an experience, in quotes, of what the I am is. And then you can get even a greater understanding or appreciation of the context of the work. So, what I'd like you to do as a listener to this is just to let your eyes close for a moment. So, without using your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions, are you a man, a woman, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions, are you defined, undefined, or neither? Without using your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, are you limited, unlimited, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, are you in a body? out of a body or neither. If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, notice the no state state of the I am. No thoughts, memory, emotions, associations or perceptions. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes to come back to the room and keep part of your awareness back there in the no state state of no thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions. 
And when you let your eyes open, a part of your awareness can be back here in the room. So you're splitting your awareness in two directions. So Maharaj spoke about the I am in terms of the verbal I am, the non-verbal I am. For example, the verbal I am would be I am good, I am bad, I am smart, I am stupid, whatever those are. So he would first say, cut that off and just have the verbal, just stay in I am, let go of bad, good, anything that comes up, just hold on to the verbal I am. Once you've gotten that clear, no thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, you have what he would call the non-verbal I am. No thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions. Let's emphasize it again. Well, let's go over it again. So let your eyes close for a moment. If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions, are you perfect, imperfect, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, what does the word perfect or imperfect even mean? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, are you worthy, unworthy, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, what does worthy or unworthy even mean? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, are you adequate, inadequate, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, what does the word adequate or inadequate even mean? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, are you alone, connected, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, what does alone or connected even mean? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, are you complete, incomplete, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, what does complete or incomplete even mean? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, are you powerful, powerless, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions, what does powerful or powerless even mean? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions, are you lovable, unlovable, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions, 
what is lovable or unlovable or love even mean? Again, notice the no state state of no thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions. Whenever you're ready, you could keeping part of your awareness back there in the no state state of no thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions. When you open your eyes, part of your awareness can be here, back here in the room. So whenever you're ready. So, just as a very quick review, if you were, for Maharaja, if you were to stay in the no state state of no thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, and discard anything that came up as not this, not that, neti neti, not this, not that. The next theme, which is a very unusual one, is people would come to Maharaj and they would say to him very, very often, how long is it going to take? I mean, after all, I have been here for like three weeks. I should be like enlightened already. And Maharaj had two answers, almost kind of tongue-in-cheek, which was, to get established in this condition, it might take some time. But hang on to your beingness only, the I am. But the other answer he gave to that was, quote, you will get maturity quickly if you stay in your nothingness. So what I'd like you to do again is to allow your eyes to close. And without using your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, Are you organized, disorganized, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, are you isolated, not isolated, or neither? If you do not use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, your perceptions, what does isolated or not isolated even mean? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, do you exist, not exist, or neither? You do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions. What does existence or non-existence even mean? Notice the no state state of non-verbal I am without thoughts, memory, emotions, associations or perceptions. Allow your awareness to move outward and backward and just notice the big emptiness.
Notice how the emptiness appears to go on forever. Notice what occurs if the witness or the awarer of the emptiness and the emptiness are made of the same substance. So, in a moment, I'll just ask you to open your eyes, noticing the emptiness, the no-state state. Notice that in the no-state state, there's no frames of reference, no references to frame. In fact, if I were to say, what's the closest verbiage or way to describe no thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, no perceptions? Is a no state state with no frames of reference, no references to frame. So as Maharaj said, you will get maturity quickly if you stay in your nothingness. The next theme is something that he said to me directly, and we'll take it in two parts. The theme is, fluids come together and the I am appears. Now, when Maharaj said, fluids come together and the I am appears, I didn't know at the time, back in about 1979, 1980, I didn't realize that he was giving a sutra, a one-sentence statement that described in detail, in detail it describes all of neuroscience, brain science, since about the early 1930s. He did that in one sentence. What does that statement mean? Fluids come together and the I am appears. I was so infected with Maharaja's virus that when he would say to me personally, fluids come together and the I am appears, all of a sudden I would be looking at brain research and looking at neuroscience and trying to figure out what was, what was he to convey to me. What I realized was that there are fluids in the brain and those fluids in the brain are called neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters, when they come together in a chemical reaction in the brain, to experience the sense of I or I am arises. If there are no fluids coming together, then there is no I am. And there is no sense of I. That means that 
if you have the think that you are, all that whole experience comes about through the, a chemical reaction. It's just chemicals coming together. So all the whole mirage, the whole illusion that I am, and I have a mission, I have a purpose, that I'm this person, that I have all these things going on, is all only taking place by a chemical reaction. Without the chemicals, you wouldn't even be. You would have no experience of being. So all, the whole idea, when he used to say, you are not a person, these fluids come together, you have this experience of I or I am, and all of a sudden you think you're a person with a mission, a path, a past, a present, a future, a future life, a past life. All of this is stuff is coming together only because fluids come together and the I am appears. The next theme, which is essential and a cousin to this, is something that you hear in the land of spirituality all the time. Now, when I was with Maharaj, he got very angry with me one day and began pacing back and forth. And he said to me, you've been around long enough. You should know by now. There is no birth. There is no death. There is no person. It's all a concept. It's all an illusion. And he went like this with his hand, and it felt like light passed through me. And he said, now you know the nothing. And so now you can leave. And when I left, it was like there was absolute nothingness. There was so much nothingness and so not I that I didn't even know that I was until after I came out of it, which was several hours later. But the, the thing that was amazing about Maharaj is he would say things like, it's all an illusion, which you've all heard, but what does it mean when you say it's all an illusion? The best way I could describe this is, again, I came back from India and I was obsessed with this is all an illusion. What does this mean? Why does this mean we hear it's all an illusion? You hear that if I live in Santa Cruz, California. So in Santa Cruz, California, if you go to the herb store, the health food store, everyone's always saying it's all an illusion. But, but what does it mean? And if it is all an illusion, why can't I see it? I also began to study quantum physics. What I realized when I studied quantum physics was that in a standard model that we all grew up with, there's a nucleus of an atom and there are electrons that go around. Now, if we took the nucleus of the atom and we expanded it to the size of the sun and the electron to the size of the earth, there would be more nothingness, more empty space between the nucleus and the electron, and there actually is between the physical earth and the sun and the earth. That means that most everything we see is actually empty, but we don't get to see it. If I could hand you a quantum lens, well, most of what you would see would be emptiness with an occasional particle. That's it. Now, the Buddhist Heart Sutra said, Form is none other than emptiness. Emptiness is none other than form, which means that this particle and this emptiness are made of the same substance. He didn't say emptiness is cool and form sucks. Because if you went to most Buddhists, they're trying to get into emptiness and discard form. He didn't say emptiness is terrific and, 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 and this sucks. He said they're both the same. Basically, you have formed and formed matter formed emptiness, and thinned out emptiness. So you have em everything is emptiness and form is condensed emptiness. So the nervous system and the brain, automatically, before you get there, 
omit, omit, omits, omits, omits all of this emptiness and only selects out a small piece. So what you see is an abstraction of nothing, of the emptiness. Now the question is, <clears throat> why or how does that even happen? The first reason is that the brain and nervous system have two primary functions. First function is survival. Fight, flight, freeze. I added a fourth, which is fight, flight, freeze, prey. The, section, the second thing is the purpose of the nervous system is to organize chaos. Now, if you went and looked in your dictionary the word, under the word chaos, the first definition is going to say something like completely out of order, out of control, something in that, in that vein. The second or third definition, depending upon which brand of Webster's Dictionary you look in, will say something like the emptiness prior to the creation of the physical universe. So that the nervous system organizes the chaos by omitting the emptiness. And it does that automatically before you're there. Next theme would be, why is it an illusion and why can't I see it? The body-mind, what Maharaj called the body-mind mechanism, the nervous system, the brain, receives four billion bytes of information per second and it can only process 2,000. That means that what the nervous system actually can see and feel and experience is 0.000054% of what's actually there. What the nervous system does, the term that's used technically is abstracts, which means the nervous system omits, 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 omits all the emptiness. And it selects out 0.000054%, and that's why the world looks solid to you. That's why you can't see the emptiness. Now, this process whereby the nervous system omits, 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 all of that emptiness and selects out this small, tiny, tiny little fraction takes place in time. Since it place, takes place in time, that means that the I, which you call I, takes place in time. It does not arise until there is enough condensation of that emptiness. Which means the I arises after the action and event has already occurred. By the time I perceive it, it's late. The nervous system and brain are late. That means everything that you see has already occurred. Now that isn't the work that work is basic neuroscience. The nervous system is late, and everything that has occurred, everything that you perceive has already occurred. What does that mean? And one of the most famous yoga statements is, you are not the doer. Why are you not the doer? You're not the doer because the time the eye arises and can perceive anything, the action and event has already occurred. There's two reasons why that it's all an illusion. The first thing is, that you do not see the emptiness. What you see is an abstracted representation, a tiny, 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 tiny little fraction of what's there. You don't see the emptiness. 
you see a solid world. The solid world is an illusion. But what's even more striking is that the perceiver of the illusion, the knower of the illusion, the aware of the illusion, the witness of the illusion is part of the illusion. The witness, knower, awarer, observer, experiencer of the illusion is part of the illusion. So it's not like I'm standing out here going, it's all an illusion. The knower, awarer, witnesser, beingness, observer of the illusion is part of the illusion. Because the observer, awarer, knower of the illusion is an abstraction of nothing. The emptiness omits, 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 and out of that comes this thing that is not there. An illusion is defined as seeing something which is not there. Since I'm seeing a chair or a person or a coffee cup or whatever that be, since I'm seeing that, I don't see the emptiness. I don't not seeing, I'm only seeing point zero 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 five four percent of what's there. I'm not seeing what's there. Therefore, it's an illusion. And the eye that's perceiving it is an abstraction or an, uh, is formed through the omission of all of that emptiness. Therefore, the perceiver of the illusion is part of the illusion. So when Maharaj looked at me and said, there is no birth, there is no death, there is no person, it's all a concept, it's all an illusion. All of these things are part of the illusion, including the knower and aware of the illusion, and more importantly, spirituality is part of the illusion. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So if I gave you a quantum lens and you looked through the quantum lens, it would all be empty with these little particles, and that would basically be it. But again, Buddha did not say emptiness is great and form sucks. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form. There's only one substance, Advaita. Advaita means one substance, not two. Einstein, 2,500 years after the Buddha, made a statement which was, that everything is emptiness and form, like this chair, my arms, your thoughts, are, is condensed emptiness. So if you took this emptiness and condensed it, condensed it, condensed it, condensed it, condensed it like Campbell's soup, what you would eventually get is form. And if you thinned it out, you would get emptiness. Some people refer to this as formed matter in the dictionary or formless matter. But there's still only one substance. So the nervous system and the brain automatically, before you get there, omit, omit, omits, omits, omits all of this emptiness and only selects out a small piece. So what you see is an abstraction of nothing, of the emptiness. Now the question is, <clears throat> why or how does that even happen? The first reason is that the brain and nervous system have two primary functions. First function is survival. Fight, flight, freeze. I added a fourth, which is fight, flight, freeze, prey. The, section, the second thing is, the purpose of the nervous system is to organize chaos. Now, if you went and looked in your dictionary the word under the word chaos, the first definition is going to say something like completely out of order, out of control, something in that, in that vein. The second or third definition, depending upon which brand of Webster's Dictionary you look in, will say something like the emptiness prior to the creation of the physical universe. So the nervous system organizes the chaos by omitting the emptiness. And it does that automatically before you're there.
So the next theme would be, I'm not the doer. And the question would be, why are you not the doer? So the I arises after the action event has already occurred, which means not only are you not the doer of the action, you also, there's no such thing as choice. Now, why is there no such thing as choice? There's no such thing as choice because the I that says, I'm going to choose this or choose that, or choose that, arises after the action has already occurred. It would be like this. I am now raising my hand. I am now going to choose to put my hand down. See, I did it. I am now going to choose to put my hand up. See, I did it. I, this, this action and event has already occurred before the I ever got there. The illusion of doership, authorship, choosership, if you will, all of those are illusions, part of the nervous system's power of illusioning. So even spirituality is part of the illusion. What did Nisargadatta mean when he makes this kind of a statement? It's a very powerful statement. And that is that everything in the physical universe, I don't care whether it's war, peace, love, hate, forgiveness, or, or revenge, every single action, every single, single experience, all perceivables and conceivables are part of the illusion. Because if you can perceive it or conceive it, it's a byproduct of the nervous system's abstracting process. So, the best way to understand Maharaja's spirituality, which is finding out who you are, is to go into Buddhism. But the word nirvana. Most people have nirvana, meaning like I am going to go into nirvana. Some heaven, some blissful place for all of eternity where everything's fantastic. But what does the word nirvana actually mean? The definition of nirvana is extinction. In fact, if you looked it up, it would generally say nirvana, literal translation, extinction. Sometimes it says annihilation. So, Buddha never really spoke much about nirvana because you can't say anything about what it is. It's total extinction. People think that spirituality is, I'm going to get rid of my ego and then I will be something. Well, I'll be something, do something, have something, create something. But the fact is that nirvana means extinction, means no I, annihilation. The I is annihilated. Of course, the I wants to have the experience of what it's like to be no I or to have nirvana. The I can't possibly have that because the I is an abstraction of nothing. It isn't. So that is why the Buddha actually said in the Diamond Sutra, he said, no being has ever entered nirvana. Of course no being has ever entered nirvana because no being ever could because a being can't enter something. Because there's no, in order to be in nirvana, there's no I, which means you wouldn't even know it. The Buddha said brilliantly that you might not necessarily be even aware of your own enlightenment. Why? Because there won't even be an eye there to realize it. Now, when he makes a statement like that, what he means is, that the I, there can never be an I which gets enlightened because the I only occurs through fluids in the brain. The I is an abstracted representation of nothing. So how can an illusion become something? See, there's an illusion around the concept of enlightenment which is that I will become something, be in this permanent, blissful, pleasurable state for all of eternity. But the I is a fiction. 
The eye is a fabrication. It's only produced by fluids created through the abstraction process. If there's no fluids, no abstraction process, no brain, there is no eye. So, so therefore, the, the idea that an eye, which is, occurs through fluids, can arise and all of a sudden become, you know, be in a permanent state for all of eternity is an illusion. So I think the best way to understand enlightenment and spirituality is to divide things up. Number one, there's a spiritual lifestyle. A spiritual lifestyle is being nice and loving and compassionate and forgiving and being part of a community and meditating and doing all of those things. Maharaj would have defined spirituality as finding out who you are through finding out who you're not. Who you're not, you're nothing perceivable or conceivable. They asked him, who are you? He'd say nothing perceivable or conceivable. So, there's a spiritual lifestyle and then there's spirituality as in finding out who you are. I had spent years in India and I lived in an ashram and I knew the game and I knew the people and I knew the chanting and the meditation and the savor and the karma yoga and I knew how to do all of that stuff. I knew how to play the game. The problem was I did not know that the spirituality was a game. When I came to Maharaj one day and he looked at me and said, do you know who you are? And I said, well, I feel a lot of love. I feel a lot of bliss. I said, I can even see energy patterns. And he did not even wait for the translation with this look of real disgust on his face. He said, I'm not interested if you're satisfied or you're pacified with your spiritual life. Do you know yourself? And I said, no. He said, until you do, you shut your mouth. Now, I knew the spiritual game. I knew how to get a nice room. I knew how to play the game, how to make friends, how to look spiritual, act spiritual, behave spiritual, and all of that stuff. But I didn't know who I was. So I was caught in the spiritual game rather than spirituality, which was the discovery of who you were. And so Maharaj would differentiate that theme very clearly, finding out who you are. And what does meditate, what does all of these things have to do, if anything, with finding out who you are? Because if I am meditating to learn how to concentrate, if I am more forgiving, if I am more this or more that, but the question would be, without using your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, or perceptions, what does forgiveness even mean? Without using your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, what does spirituality mean? If you do not use your thoughts, your memory, your emotions, your associations, your perceptions, what's enlightenment? If you don't use your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, what's purification? So if you were to stay in the no-state state of the non-verbal I am and discard everything else, what you start seeing is mostly they are spiritual concepts. And it's very, very difficult and I would say very, very painful when you realize that you've been organized your entire life around concepts. Next theme would be 
concepts. One of the things when you look at all the material, Maharaj is always saying, it's a concept, it's a concept, discarded, it's a concept, it's a concept. But what does he mean by concept? Now again, to best appreciate what it, that is, I'm going to use a term coined by Jacques Derrida, the founder of postmodernism. Derrida had a word which was difference, difference with an A. What it means is that all words refer to other words, refer to other words, refer to other words, refer to other words. So we clearer. If I say to you, I feel happy, you would say, well, what do you mean by happy? I would say, well, how, how, what's that mean? I would say, well, happy is kind of these sensations in my chest, in my heart. And you would say, well, what's, what's sensations? And you go, well, sensations are this kind of energy that's moving through my body and it kind of accumulates in my heart. And I'd say, well, what's energy? Well, energy is kind of this feeling that I have that goes, these things are going through my body. What's a feeling? Feelings are... So, what you notice is that all words or concepts... To get to the meaning of that concept, you have to go to another word, which goes to another word, which goes to another word, which goes to another word, which means that things are always referring or deferring their meaning to other words. That means that all of these words are true only in a linguistic system. Without language, you would have no idea what things mean. You might have an experience of sensation, but you wouldn't even know what it meant without a linguistic map. Now, why is that a concept to be discarded? If I say the word chair, there's nothingness with particles, abstract, abstract, emptiness is omitted, 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 gone, emptiness, gone, emptiness. Now we have the concept of chair. That is a concept because it is an abstracted representation of nothing. Therefore, it is something to be discarded. So, Maharaj says, discard all concepts. You're discarding everything that is in language, which is pretty much everything. So, if I say, I love you, I love you is language. Language is a, only formed through the omission of emptiness. It's omitted, 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 and now we have words in speech called language. Each one of these things are only true on the level of language. They are not true because language is only a representation of something that's not there anyway to begin with. Because it all is an abstraction of nothing. So they're all concepts, be them spiritual concepts, like God or heaven or the universe, or practical concepts like computers and chairs and I love you and I hate you and all of these things are only words which describe experiences which are only formed through the omission of emptiness and having the substance there. The abstraction process.
The next theme, which of course would always come around with Maharaj, is the guru. Now, when I first went to him, and, I, and he said, are you willing to stay eight days and absorb the teachings? And, and I said, whatever Maharaj wants me to do, I'll do. I was into the guru game, and I didn't know it. I didn't know I was even into the Guru games. I didn't know it was a game. Maharaj's reply to me was, don't you understand? I don't play that game. If you want to play the Guru Disciple game, go play it somewhere else. Now, I had played the Guru Disciple game with Baba Muktananda for many years, and it was really time for me to, to let go of this. And so, what I started to get clear about being with Maharaj is, <clears throat> he had a Guru. His guru gave him, gave him the basic teachings, which was, you are that, there's only one substance, you are the absolute reality, question everything, don't believe anything. He gave him those teachings. And Maharaj will say, and I held on to those and I believed him, and what happened was all of this came to pass. It took for him somewhere around three years. When you get further into Maharaj and you get clearer about the I am, Maharaj makes a statement which is the guru walks with you to the final goal. The guru is your own self. The guru walks with you to the final goal. Something like that all throughout the work. What you start understanding is that the guru is the I am. The guru is not something out there. The guru is the I am. You without using your thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, are the guru. The illusion is that there's a guru out there rather than understand that the guru is who you are. So naturally, since the guru is the I am without thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, naturally the guru is going to be with you all the time Obviously, the guru knows what you do because it's you. And that is the key thing. You, it is you. Without thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions, you are the guru. Now, unfortunately, the question always arises is, what is a guru? A guru is somebody who knows who they are. Now, because somebody knows who they are, does not necessarily mean that they can teach, that they can even communicate or describe to you. In other words, because somebody knows who they are does not mean they can play the piano. Because somebody knows who they are does not mean they can fix a car. Because somebody knows who they are doesn't mean they, they can run a four-minute mile. So there's knowing who you are, and then there's the ability to teach. Now, I'm not saying that Nisargadatta is the only person who knew who they were and could somehow teach. What I am saying is, he was the only person that I met that those two things came together in such a clear, powerful way. And so, I think very often people will confuse knowing who you are and the ability to teach. And because those things are so not necessarily connected, what you have is people who have done spirituality or yoga for years and years and years, and suffered. Now, part of this to understand is I was with many, many gurus, and one particularly, Baba Prakashananda, who I loved tremendously. He was really sweet and wonderful, but he was a very, very poor teacher for me. For somebody else, he might have been the greatest teacher in the world. You have to be your own barometer. If you've been with somebody, and Maharaj will say this, if you've been with somebody for years and you're still suffering, or well, if you've been with somebody for years and you feel more and more, in quotes, liberated, then obviously you've picked the right person or you've picked the wrong person. The qualifier for me always is, after years, am I clearer? Am I closer? Do I have a greater understanding of knowing who I am and also understanding who I'm not? Rather than blaming yourself, I would suggest noticing is it really right for me? Is it a hand-in-glove mix with this particular teacher? And if it's not, to leave rather than doing what I did for years, which is hanging out with someone who was, knew who they were but couldn't teach to suit me 
and then thinking somehow I had to take on the act and role or game of that particular spiritual discourse or context and play that out. So there are several questions to ask. One is, can they teach and can they teach me? So the guru is the I am without thoughts, memory, emotions, associations, perceptions. So you are that guru. And whether the, in quotes, person outside of you who's giving you those teachings can teach as a teaching right for you, you have to be your own barometer. Sometimes a question arises about ritualized worship or puja, since Maharaj certainly did arati or chanting three times a day. And the best way I could relate this is I was once there with him and a man had brought him a present. And he put it in front of Maharaj and five minutes went by, ten minutes went by, fifteen minutes went by. Maharaj never did anything. All of a sudden, the man said to Maharaj, I brought you a present. Why don't you open it? And he got very intense. And he looked at the man and he said, I know why you brought this present. I even know what's in it. I don't need anything. I don't even need my own self. But I still do arati three times a day to my guru. And that's a mystery. The next theme is cause and effect. What Maharaj says was, said was that no thing has a specific cause and a specific effect. What does that mean? There's a very famous quote in a book called the Yoga Vashishta. And the quote is something like this. A crow lands on a coconut tree. At about the same time, a coconut falls. But the mind puts it together that the, coconut, the crow caused the coconut to fall. Okay. Since there is only one substance in the universe, there cannot be a separate, localized, individual thing causing a specific, localized effect. It would be like if everything in the universe was made of the ocean and water, one specific particle or one specific droplet in the ocean could not cause something else to move. There is an illusion of cause and effect, and the illusion of cause and effect is formed by the abstraction process. In other words, the nervous system, by abstracting and omitting and omitting and omitting and omitting all of the emptiness and coming out with a solid thing, also draws conclusions that this caused that. Now, in 1964, John Stuart Bell created what was called Bell's Theorem. Noted physicist Henry Stapp would say, quote, the discovery of Bell's Theorem was the most profound discovery in all of science, unquote. Bell's Theorem basically says there is no local cause and there is no location. What does that mean? Location is dependent upon position. You can't have location unless you have a specific isolated position in space-time. 
There's no local causes and there's no local separate individual event here that you can say causes that particular thing over there. There is no cause and effect other than there's an illusion of cause and effect. This brings to a very, very important light karma. Maharaj said, quote, there is no karma. That, uh, what is the, the karma? The karma. That's the reason that you come back in a body form. It's a combination uh, of the state and the heart uh, having that karma. There is no karma in the state of Parabrahman. Where is the Vajra Karma? Karma is a story used to organize chaos. Why did something bad happen? It must have been something here that I did back when, if not in this life, then in some other life, that caused this particular thing to happen. But there is none, because there's no local causes. There's only one substance. In order for something to happen, the entire universe has to go along with it. It would be like this in relationship to cause and effect and choosing. Imagine you had the ocean and a wave in the ocean, and in the ocean there was a particle or a droplet. It would be like imagining a droplet in the ocean could cause, or the chop, a droplet in the ocean could create or choose to go someplace else other than where the entire ocean is going. If the entire ocean is going towards this particular beach, it's going there. The illusion that the droplet of water or you might have is that you caused or created this. But how could you possibly, because the I arose after the action and event already occurred. So how could you have caused it? There's only the illusion of cause and, cause and effect. There is no cause and effect. So the next theme Maharaj talked about was the nothingness or the void. And he made a statement that was very curious, which is the nothingness and the void had no interest in them. Even the word nothingness and void mean nothing to me. When I first heard him say that, years later I was reminded of His Holiness the Dalai Lama when I first met him. And what he said was, the mind is devoid of mind. In other words, the I, there always is an I or a witness there, even if there's an experience of the void. With the experience of the void, there's an I experiencing the void. Therefore, the I and all experiences, including the experience of the void, 
including spirituality, are all I-dependent. If there's no I, there's no void, there is no spirituality. So you have to understand that all psychology and spirituality is dependent upon the belief in the existence of a subject I. But if the subject I is a representation of nothing, a coming together of fluids in the brain, and without the fluids there's no I, then there is no spirituality separate from the fluid. Now, what that means is there's some subtle belief that there's a I, a big I, floating in the sky up there somewhere, or a spirituality that's beyond what we, we see. But the fact is that, that spirituality is I-dependent. If there's no perceiver, there's no spirituality. In fact, if there's no perceiver, there is no world. And the best single statement I have ever heard is from the Yoga Vashishta. With Sanskrit, it is Drishti Shrishti Vada. And it translates as, the world is only there as long as there's an I there to perceive it. As long as there's abstraction going on and an I there, then there's going to be a world perceived. Once that process ends, there is no I and there is no world. It happens on a daily, on a daily level. Maharaj used to say, when you go to sleep at night, the I disappears, and you're not, and the world is not. So the entire universe and world is dependent upon, and spirituality and psychology is dependent upon the fluids come together and the I am appears and the abstraction process. No fluids, no I am, no abstraction process, and you are not. The I wants to go on forever. That's why the I has come up with ideas like an afterlife. Maharaj said reincarnation is a concept for the ignorant masses. The I does not want to die. The I wants to go on and on and on. It's actually what many people don't know, although it should be right up front as far as teaching is, what is the difference between Hinduism and Buddhism? Buddha <coughs> was a Hindu. Hindus believe there's a separate individual, independent soul, which incarnates from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. What is Buddha's realization under the Bodhi tree 2,500 years ago? There is no separate individual, independent self or soul that transmigrates or incarnates from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. Maharaj used to, used to say it's all an illusion, and the perceiver of the illusion obviously is part of the illusion. What I like actually is the word mirage. Most psychology and spirituality is trying to make a better mirage, make yourself into a better mirage. You are a mirage that does not know it's a mirage. And hence, you're trying to make yourself better. Spirituality and psychology and the world and the perceiver of the world is part of that mirage. Maharaj summed it up best when he said, you are the child of a barren woman. And when somebody asked him, well, what am I going to do with my life? He said, now you're making plans for the child of a barren woman. 